Welcome. My name is Jeff Wyma, and I'm a professor of New Testament at Calvin Theological Seminary. Uh, this video is actually a follow-up to a video you hopefully just watched, namely uh, a sermon that I preached on 1 Thessalonians 4, 13 to 18. Ideally, I would have liked to have preached that sermon to you in person, so that then afterwards we could have a kind of Q&A question and answer session. Now, that unfortunately is not possible. And so instead, what I'd like to do is, is kind of have a debriefing session in which I talk out loud about the kind of moves or the things that I thought about as I left the study where I did the exegesis, the then and there of the text, and how I moved to the pulpit when I talked about the here and now, the preaching. When people judge preaching today, too often they have, I think, wrong criteria for judging a sermon to be good or bad. What's makes a good sermon? In too many minds, it's three things. One, how long is it? And then typically, of course, long is bad and short is good. Two um, is how interesting and preferably funny it is. And then three, how relevant or practical it is. Now, in a sense, there's nothing wrong with these three criteria. I do think that when one speaks, one ought to be uh, shorter than longer. I actually have a motto that goes like this. The longer I am, the better I'd better be. I'm going to say that again. The longer I am, the better I'd better be. In other words, if I'm going to talk long to you, I better be really good. I better be on the top of my game because the longer I am, I know that people only have a limit to how much they're going to listen to a particular person. So I do think it's good to look carefully about how long one is and to avoid being excessively lengthy. Two, I also think it's important to be practical and uh, to be relevant. Uh, it's important for uh, hearers to hear how the text is uh, applicable to their life and their situation. And thirdly, of course, uh, I just reversed those order uh, in, in my discussion now, but also uh, to be interesting and preferably funny. There's a appropriate place for humor, even in the pulpit. Of course, you don't want to be disrespectful, but there's nothing wrong with... Uh, with uh, enjoying oneself as you explain uh, the scriptures. But even though those three criteria aren't bad, they shouldn't be the sole criteria or the primary criteria by which we judge a sermon, good or bad. Because the truth is, I can preach a sermon that is short, that is interesting, even funny, and is practical. And notice, nowhere have I said how biblical I am, how faithful I am to scripture. Or in other words, how, how appropriately I handled the scriptures. You see, that really is what sets apart a good sermon from a bad sermon, namely whether the preacher or the teacher, if you're talking about a teaching class, it's the same thing for that, whether the teacher or the preacher followed faithfully the right hermeneutic, whether they approached the passage from a Holy Spirit grammatical, literary, historical, and theological element. That ought to be the criteria by which a sermon is judged to be good or bad. Now let's take that criteria, those five hermeneutical categories, and apply it to the sermon that you just heard I gave on 1 Thessalonians 4, 13 to 18. First then, the Holy Spirit element. The idea that the Holy Spirit needs to illumine our sin-darkened minds so we can hear and heed the voice of God. Now, that's more of a subjective category of the five hermeneutical categories. And it was one that I tried to highlight by opening our time with a prayer for illumination. And I made that even more explicit by reading at least three texts, two from John and one from 1 Corinthians, which highlighted the important work of the Holy Spirit in illuminating our minds. And of course, the work of the Holy Spirit was done in the prep work for the sermon. When I was in my study, when I first open the scriptures and thought about this passage, I prayed for the Spirit to be present. So the Holy Spirit element was there, not so much in the sermon, it's hard to show that in an obvious way, but it was very much an important part of the preparation and preaching process. Secondly, we have the grammatical element, ways in which my knowledge of the original Greek text taught me something new or more than what I could get just on the basis of English. Now, there are lots of things under the exegetical section in this series that I had to just leave in the pulpit, uh, leave in the study and not bring to the pulpit. 
But there were a couple of areas or places in the sermon where I referred to the original text. For example, I talked about the word or the verb to fall asleep. And I highlighted the fact that that wasn't to be taken literally. That Paul wasn't referring to those who knock off, right? And who snore during a boring sermon. No, this was a metaphor, a euphemism for death and how that was important for interpretation. I also referred to the double negative, the emphatic future negation, not just that we who are living will not proceed, but we will certainly, we will definitely not proceed. How Paul was stressing that given the pastoral problem, namely those who were worried that those who had died would somehow be at a disadvantage, that those who were living would precede those who had passed away. So I did bring some of those to the sermon, but I had to leave a lot of that exegetical stuff uh, behind in the study. What about literary, the form and the structure of the passage? I didn't spend any time, of course, in the sermon or beforehand justifying why I began at verse 13 and why I ended at verse 18. I did all of that work. So if someone came up after the sermon and said, uh, Pastor Jeff, why didn't you uh, keep reading and keep talking about the following verses? Because after all, the following verses, chapter 5, 1 to 11, they also deal with the second coming of Jesus. How come you didn't do that? I would have an answer for that, right? Because I had some grounds for ending it where I did. But there was one literary aspect that did make it to the sermon, and that had to do with the internal structure of the passage. I had an outline to my sermon that I said came from Paul's structure of the text. That's a literary kind of question, where Paul has a strategy for moving from the beginning, the problem of grieving, to the end, the solution of being encouraged or comfort. And that also then made it to the sermon. For historical... That was an important part, I think, of this sermon. In other words, there was a danger I could see of people too quickly jumping to today and how the passage would be relevant for them and not slowing down and first saying, what was the historical context? What was going on in the Thessalonian church? And that was my distinction between Paul the pastor and Paul the predictor, right? If you only look at what the passage is, For today, and a lot of people are excited about end time stuff and eschatology, it's easy to turn this passage or to misuse this passage as a way of predicting the future. And no, I wanted to stress the historical context that the Thessalonians was a real congregation and they had a real problem that people were grieving and grieving deeply about those who had fallen asleep. And that was important to see the pastoral focus of Paul in this passage and how that pastoral focus ought to come out in the preaching and application for the audience uh, today. I had to leave out things that uh, Paul talked about. He talked about grieving like the, the rest of men who have no hope. You may have watched and remembered how in the exegesis in this series, we went back in time and said, what were the views towards the afterlife in Paul's day? Is it really true that people in Paul's day didn't have hope for life after death? And we found some evidence of that. I didn't bring any of that to the pulpit. I suppose I could have, but I made a judgment call and thought I didn't have time and it wasn't crucial enough for me to, uh, to include in the message. So that's an example of some stuff that that we left in the study. I did talk about the word of the Lord, but notice how quickly I went through the first two questions, namely, where did Paul get this word of the Lord? And two, what in the following verses is the word of the Lord and therefore might be put in red letters? And I went just straight for what I thought was the most important question. Why does Paul cite the word of the Lord? And I gave an answer to that, namely that Paul gives emphasis or weight to his argument. It isn't just his opinion, but it's an authoritative teaching of Jesus Christ. Theological. There was something important theological in the sermon that had to do with a biblical view of death. It was the business of whether it's okay for Christians to grieve. And I wanted to stress that because I've experienced that, not just in the example I gave from Sister Vandenberg, who said that God must be disappointed with her, but I have other stories like that, other examples of how Christians think either it's inappropriate for them to grieve or somehow they downplay their grief because, you know, mature believers or two Christians instead celebrate the good things, uh, uh, you know, about, uh, about life after death. And so it was important for, for me in the sermon 
to give the biblical evidence, you know, that, that God created us to live, not to die, that death is a consequence of the fall. You know, the Paul talks about death being an enemy, not a friend, and, and especially the example of Jesus who grieved in the context of the death of his friend uh, Lazarus. It's, it's really important for people to hear that the Bible allows them to grieve, almost demands that they grieve, right? Weep with those who weep. That's such an important pastoral point that the church uh, has gotten wrong, I'm afraid, and needs to hear today. And therefore, I think that that was emphasized in the sermon. Now, I also talked about the rapture in the sermon, and um, that was a tricky thing. Actually, it's not good normally to, in your sermon, have a subject of such difference and of such length that would distract from the main part of the message, right? The main part of the message was a focus on comfort, the pastor side of Paul. And so by talking about the rapture, that was a kind of a sidebar. That was a kind of diversion. And again, normally in a sermon, you shouldn't do that. That's not a strategy that I would normally recommend. It's better to stick with the one central overarching theme or function or focus of the passage. My only excuse is, well, um, the business of the rapture, the business of the end times is such an important subject and unfortunately largely misunderstood subject in the church today that I thought it demanded some attention. Now, of course, a lot of this would depend on your particular context. If you're in a context where you have less time to talk about these things, well, then obviously I would have cut out that part. I would have kept only the Paul, the pastor side of things. Or maybe I'm in a church where in a different context, either in another sermon or in a series of educational classes, I had a chance to talk about these matters. And I knew I could correct and address those things in a different context. And therefore, I wouldn't talk about it in the message itself. But those are at least some decisions that one has to make. Often in terms of preaching, there aren't absolute rights and wrongs. It's more a question of judgment, wisdom, and the particular context in which you were called to minister. One question I think you should ask of yourself when you hear a sermon and when you write a sermon and that is the percentage of the message that is exegesis and the percentage of the sermon that is application. Remember, this is a distinction. That's an important one. Exegesis deals with the then and there of the passage. What was God saying to the people then? Right? And then once we solve that question, then we can move on to the here and now. Now, there's no absolute number on how much a sermon should be exegesis, how much should be application, but there are some principles that one should follow. There should be enough exegesis in a sermon that people hear what? Not your opinion, not just your reflections on a subject, but people hear the authoritative voice of God. In other words, you need to spend time in the text and explain the text for as long as is needed and in as, in as much detail as is needed so that people hear, again, not just your opinion, but they hear the authoritative voice of God, the mustness of the scriptures. So there has to be enough of that in a sermon. How much application should there be? Well, there should be enough application so that people see how the text is relevant for their own life. People far too often hear a passage, hear a sermon, and they say, oh, that would be good for so-and-so. Or they might say, oh, I sure hope so-and-so was listening to the sermon today. You see how quickly we tend to think of how passages are relevant for other people and we fail, we're blind to see how it's relevant for us. And so I think the preacher needs to think carefully about how can I make a passage relevant for each person in my audience today? So what does that mean? That means, first of all, being as specific as possible, right? Not just being abstract in general, but concretizing the example so that people don't have to think hard, don't, they don't have to imagine because you're spelling it out for them how this passage impacts their life. And also thinking of examples for different age groups and different walks of life. Don't have all your examples focused just on your own age group, right? I mean, the temptation is you think about how the passage is relevant for you and then you concentrate on that in your message. But wait a minute, you may not be an average person. What about young people in your church? What about older people in your church? What about people of different genders? What about people maybe who are attending who are not a Christian? So think more broadly about your applications in terms of um, its specificity and to whom they're aimed at. And some final kind of just miscellaneous comments 
Um, I started off the sermon with a story. Good sermons, I think, begin with a story that kind of captures the interest of the audience. My story was kind of a funny one, and I, th- I think it's fine for the audience to laugh, although there were some dangers there. Someone might think that I was making fun of these women students, but of course, if you heard me carefully, I, I didn't. I said at the end that they were actually more biblical than I was. And I held them up as an example for me and for others to follow. So I think uh, having a story like that, an illustration, uh, and even if it's funny, that, that's, that's perfectly fine, as long as it's appropriate to the context uh, that you find yourself in. I also used um, a personal story in the sermon. At the very end, I talked about something very personal, in fact. I talked about the death of our second child. And, um, well, there are, uh, I think, some advantages to that. Um, I think that all illustrations and examples as much as possible should be personal. In other words, they shouldn't be some just preacher example or preacher illustration. I think you know what I'm talking about. You've you've surely heard a sermon where the preacher talks about people or talks about some situation. And you may not say it out loud, but you kind of say to yourself, I don't think that really happened to him. I think he just read about it in a book. You know, it sounds too cliche, too generic to really be true. And people today want authenticity. They want you to be genuine and sincere. And so if you talk about your own life or personal experiences, that's one way to communicate that sense of authenticity. Now, like anything good, something good can be turned into something bad. You can overdo it. So if you're always talking about your life, well, that isn't so healthy either. So one has to be wise and prudent uh, as you try to follow that principle. But I thought in this passage... Um, It was personal. Um, In some cases, um, it can be a little bit too personal. In other words, you know, one has to be careful that you don't tell such a personal story that what can happen? Well, one, I could become over, you know, overly emotionally caught up in the death of my son that 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 might interfere with what was happening. Or I have to be careful not to be so personal that I referred to people's lives, my own or my family, that some might feel that that was uncomfortable or inappropriate. So again, one has to be wise in how you live out that. I had an outline in my sermon. There was a structure, and uh, some people feel strongly about outlines, either good or bad. In my mind, outlines are good for a pastor to have. People ought to know that you have a clear path, right? You've thought about not just what you're going to say, but how you're saying it, right? You, You have some direction that you want to take them on. And so I think it's important to share that with them. Also, I think it's helpful for them because a good sermon will cause people to mentally or emotionally leave you for a while. In other words, you'll say something or they'll hear something about the text that they'll apply to their own life. You haven't said it, but they're doing their own application and the spirit is working in that way. And that's a good thing. But now you want to make it easy for them to get back on the journey with you. You want to give them kind of a roadmap so that when they leave you, they have a, a relatively easy way to kind of rejoin you again. And so an outline or a structure, I think, is helpful for your audience in that regard. And then, of course, an outline is helpful for not just understanding a passage, but remembering a passage. I think that if you give them, you know, the whole sermon is too much. There's just too much. There's a big blob of information. It's too much for them to take home. But wait a minute, if you give them an outline that they can kind of hang their mental hat on, Oh, then they can kind of remember the outline, and then they, once they remember the main points, and then it triggers their mind for the other things for which those main points were fleshed out. In the message, I deliberately referred to the left behind people or dispensationalists as brothers or sisters. I know I did that twice, I think maybe three times in the sermon, and again, that was deliberate because I know that some of you listening, um, maybe come from that community and um, are not happy with some of the exegetical arguments I was making because it's not what you at least believed up till now and and maybe you still have to think about whether or not what I presented to you is indeed faithful to Scripture and therefore you might have to change your mind. But I wanted anyone from a different camp to know that I still respect them, I still care for them, I still consider them as brothers and sisters in Christ. And so um, I don't know whether I carried off that discussion in the sermon in the right tone or not. I'll let you decide that. But it certainly was my intention, and I tried to 
uh, carry that out by referring to uh, people I disagreed with, right, as brothers or sisters. And I think that's an important thing to remember in a sermon that um, you don't use vocabulary that marginalizes or give people a too easy excuse to uh, turn you off or not hear what you are saying. Finally, and you'll be happy when you hear the word finally, right? Uh, that's what people in the pew get excited when they hear the word finally because that means the end is almost here and that's indeed the case. Finally, I wrote down to myself, don't bring too much to the pulpit. I've already said that already, but I want to spell it out again. There is that saying that, you know, less is more. And um, I need to remember that. And maybe you're like me. You're, you're one of the people who are just too excited about all the things you discovered in the text and in your study. And you bring way too much to the pulpit or the classroom. And as a result, you know, you're rushed. You don't have the time. People are overwhelmed with information. And so um, one has to be kind of ruthless about that. Uh, I don't know if I'm ruthless enough. I'm working at it. But one has to think very, very carefully about now, is this essential, right? Is this important for my audience to hear? Does it support the overarching theme or central teaching of the passage? Or is it somewhat of a secondary point? And while it might be nice to know about, it certainly wouldn't undermine my message if I leave it out. So uh, less is more. Well, with that comment, I uh, hope that these uh, kind of debriefing comments are helpful as you think about how now you are going to not only exegete a passage, but especially make that transition from the study uh, to the pulpit or the classroom. And I again thank you for your time and attention.